when you think about it, there are a couple of million orthopedic treatments that are offered every year in the United States. And some of those do fortunately very well. Some of those do poorly. And the reasons for them doing poorly could be related to a problem with diagnosis, a problem with poor patient selection, poor execution of the treatment, uh, poor follow-up, or a myriad of other causes. And you can imagine how much smarter we would be as a specialty if we knew the outcomes of those millions of treatments that were offered. Unfortunately, as you know from looking at the literature, the results of uh, perhaps only a tenth of a percent of orthopedic treatments are available in the literature. So this information cannot be shared and we cannot as a specialty learn from these experiences. And this is really a tragedy, I think. We do a lot of research, but we don't do a systematic effort to try to capture the results of our treatments, whether they are good or bad. This man was buried in an unmarked grave after he got fired for showing this slide. And it lets you know the fate of people who, and I'm, this is a warning to our three speakers here, because this is the, <laughs> the fate that often befalls people who are very interested in outcomes. But what I want to call to your attention is the full statement of his end result idea. And the uh, italics there are his. He says that you need to have a system for capturing outcomes. And it ought to be the responsibility of the hospital or the patient care organization to follow every patient it treats long enough to determine whether or not the treatment has been successful. Now, um, Darren is going to talk about success as a result, as a factor in health quality. Uh, and Mike is going to talk about uh, uh, success as the avoidance of complications. But then Codman said, and this very important thing, and this part of this statement is often lost, if this treatment was not successful, we need to inquire, if not, why not, with a view to trying to prevent future failures. So I call to your attention this statement. The reason that uh, Codman got fired is because of his com comparing the healthcare system at, uh, in Boston to this golden goose ostrich that laid golden eggs as long as it had its head in the sand. In other, and he, you can, it's hard to read this slide, but uh, uh, the ostrich is wondering if uh, it would continue to lay these golden eggs if the true results of uh, the treatment were known. So with that as a, as a cautionary introduction, I'd like to bring up uh, our colleague, Dr. Daly, who's going to give us an overview of outcomes. And then she'll be followed by Darren and Mike, who will be talking about health quality and complications. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Chapman and Dr. Matson, especially Dr. Matson, for those words of advice coming uh, forward. Um, so our, our disclosure slide, uh, we have the following disclosures. Um, <laughs> today's objectives um, are to include a general introduction to outcomes measures. It should take about 15 minutes, followed by Dr. Lee's discussion of complications and outcomes, as well as Dr. Davidson's discussion of orthopedics and clinical research. Hopefully, we'll have time at the end for discussion. When we discuss outcomes today, we're referring to the study of end results of healthcare services. Medical outcomes research focuses on the patient's experience of healthcare, on their preferences, and in their values for quality of life or longevity. Objective findings are another uh, type of outcomes, but in general, when we talk about outcomes measures, we're talking about some of these subjective experiences. The graph represents the increasing focus on outcome studies in the orthopedics literature specifically. I did a basic PubMed search for the certain time points that are noted on the x-axis. And you can see that from 1950 to 1980, I found one study that matched just orthopedics and outcomes. Uh, coming up to uh, the last decade, it was up to 5,000. And with a projected rate of 10,000 in this decade, with 2,000 already being published since just last year. Um, thank you, Dr. Masson, for pointing out that uh, the father of end results is widely regarded to be Dr. Codman. Um, he wasn't just interested in orthopedics and uh, shoulders. He was uh, in, uh, interested in outcomes. And I think we're lucky to have Dr. Matson here uh, to enlighten us about Dr. Codman. Um, 
the interesting thing about this slide is that this um, uh, cartoon was done in 1915. And shortly thereafter, as Dr. Matson said, Dr. Codman was fired. And there really weren't that many studies. I mean, even between 1950 and 1980, there was only the one uh, published outcome study. And then big uh, revolution in outcome studies is widely regarded to be the Wittenberg and Gittleson article from Science of 1973. And they were looking at outcomes um, sort of secondarily. First, they were looking at utilization data to try to decide where to give money to different hospitals. And what they found was that in the state of Vermont, um, the effectiveness of any given level of delivery of health care was just not known. Um, a striking example was surgical treatments, and I'll talk a little bit about tonsillectomy, which I thought was interesting. Um, assuming that all age-specific rates were, were uh, the same, uh, a child in Vermont at that time had about a 19% chance of getting a tonsillectomy by age 20. However, at certain centers, let's say this one, um, the rate could be as high as 66%. Um, they found that that had almost nothing to do with an increased rate of disease in that uh, city because the five surrounding neighborhoods all had a 19% rate. And assuming that the kids in those neighborhoods were generally the same, it seemed that it didn't match up. A similar study was done for surgery and low back pain by Dr. Lozier in Spine of 1991. They published that um, despite looking at many explanatory variables, including you know, things that you would think of percentage of the labor force that's in heavy labor, uh, socioeconomic status type questions, uh, saturation of surgeons. They couldn't find any reason why people in one county compared to another could have 15-fold differences in the variability of back pain surgery that they got. It called uh, and called for increased focus on outcomes, which I think was about the year after Dr. Chapman said that he got here. Uh, as well. So this sort of idea of needing to account for your outcomes and publish your outcomes um, was really getting off the ground in the 90s um, and has continued to today, again, with the 2,000 studies in the last year. Um, so what are outcomes measures? What are we talking about when we talk about outcomes measures? The classic outcomes measure that is both objective and binary is mortality. Uh, however, in the domain of orthopedics, this can be rarely applicable and less useful for study. Um, physiologic measures, we look at things like range of motion, laboratory markers for infection, and so on, as well as things like clinical events, like uh, readmission to the hospital or length of stay at the hospital to use as objective measures. They're easily available. They're in a medical record. You can study them more easily. However, uh, they don't really capture the impact of treatments on the patient's overall function. As patient centers outcomes measures are increasingly utilized, we realize that the clinical and objective surrogate markers that we have been using for health aren't, uh, aren't very good and have shortcomings in predicting patients' returns to their functional role and the things that they truly value. So recognizing that the impact of our treatments is something that physicians, and particularly surgeons, have historically been less talented at Outcomes measures have been developed to try and make this subjective objective. Um, a study I found that was really interesting, I thought it was in 1989 uh, with the RAND Corporation when they were developing the SF36 instrument for measuring healthcare outcomes. And what they found was that just having uh, objective measures didn't capture people's perception of their healthcare. And looking at patients with low perceptions of their health care, they actually had more office visits, more phone calls to the office, and more office charges. And, and then patients with higher health care perceptions. And the interesting thing was that physicians had about a 50% hit rate if they could guess their patient. Do they have a high health perception or a low health perception? And more often than not, when we were wrong, we thought that they were doing better than they thought they were doing. So, Subjective measures, I think, are good, but we need to make them more objective so that we're all speaking the same language. So what do you do to make an outcomes measure? How is it a, an objective measure of something that is subjective? Um, these are widely considered to be the psychometric properties that make something an objective outcome measure. Uh, validity, does it work? Um, what population does it work in? Uh, reliability, does it work every time if you give it to the same person in the same health state? Um, and the ones in italics are, are more specific to subjective outcomes measures that we'll be talking about and will be discussed a little bit later, 
but generally they speak to the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Um, as we know from uh, basic statistics, you increase the sensitivity, but you, you give something up usually in specificity and, and the ceiling and floor effects, responsiveness, discriminatory ability, minimally important cl clinical differences help you select what type of outcome study you actually want and how uh, valid it and reliable it can be for your patient. So that's great. You make your outcomes measure and you think, great, we're going to use this instrument. Um, but then you realize that there's a lot of different instruments out there as well. And there are different ways to look at your health outcomes. You can do general health. You can do it by, I mean, an orthopedics anatomic classification is quite common or subspecialty classification. Um, the people who write books about this always have a statement that says, development of skills to assess subjective attributes is not easy. And as you can tell, just choosing the correct path to go down could also be not easy. Another difficulty in outcome studies is how to manage the amount of data that these outcomes instruments produce. On the left, uh, you can see a, a classic simple outcomes instrument, the simple shoulder test that was developed by Dr. Matson. Um, data collection with this instrument is pretty self-explanatory. It is self-administered, it is binary, um, and it is 12 questions long. On the right, you can see the short uh, musculoskeletal functional assessment, which is a 46-question instrument that is more generalized. So you get a bigger picture of somebody's overall health care. It's not as targeted as a shoulder test. But at the same time, you can imagine as a patient coming for six clinic visits in a year, having to fill out 46 questions, they're on a five-point Likert scale, and the, the amount of information that that takes, as well as where do you store it securely, how do you use it, who has access to it. All of these things are mandated in outcomes research, being able to collect and use this data. But the idea of who's in charge of it, who pays for keeping track of it, all of those things are questions that come up in general orthopedics outcomes literature. So how do you use them once you have them? Um, the application can be for monitoring and improving quality, for example, in databases and registries that have been followed, um, particularly in other countries, but hopefully soon in our country too, um, to man maintain outcomes. Like Dr. Codman said, follow every patient, follow every implant, find out how they do. Managing complications, excuse me, managing complications, which is something that Dr. Lee will touch on, as well as the study of impact of healthcare services on your patient to find out how they're doing objectively compared to other people. Um, and finally, using outcomes measures as um, a tool in the relationships between patients, providers, and payers. Um, there's different axes in all of the people who help determine what healthcare the people get and how they perceive it. Um, we'll start with the one that probably is most obvious to everyone in this room, which is the patient and provider uh, network. The most obvious place where this is used is in informed consent. On a day-to-day -day basis, you explain to people the typical outcomes for both your practice, yourself, as well as within orthopedics and the general literature, and what they can expect. Um, this is a very important and practical place where outcomes measures are used on a day-to-day -day basis. Additionally, it's important that you know that the patients also have access to different data on the internet, and the, your ability to publish or to provide data to them in a transparent manner will help them make their decisions. Next, between the patient and the payer, and the payer here would be anyone who funds health care for the patient. Um, increasingly, uh, the, the type and amount of treatment that patients get is determined at least partially by the amount that they can afford. Health care costs are being transferred to the patients, and having information on their side as well as helping um, on the provider and payer side, having our input into the payers to make sure that the patients are getting the most up-to-date treatments that are validated and evidence-based as policies for healthcare payment don't necessarily reflect the changing trends in orthopedics outcomes. The final um, area would be this kind of Shangri-La existence where we all have perfect data to make the best decisions for every patient in every situation. And I think that when Dr. Davidson and Dr. Lee talk, we'll find that that's um, a very lofty goal, but maybe not so practical. And finally, and this is my conclusion uh, slide before we hear from them, is that we are increasingly going to be linked our reimbursement to our outcomes. Um, in effect of this year, in October, value-based purchasing will go into, <coughs> excuse me, go into effect uh, within Medicare. This links providers' payments to improved performance. 
The form of payment, uh, this form of payment holds healthcare providers accountable for both the cost and quality of the care that they provide. It attempts to reduce inappropriate care, which we all, I think, would be a good goal to have, and to identify and reward the best performing providers, which is where it gets trickier. Um, it's going to be tied to a lot of different areas, but those that directly affect us most will probably be within the surgical care, as well as the patient's perception of their care. Uh, within surgical care, the outcomes that will be measured are things such as uh, type and distribution of antibiotics around surgery, beta blocker use around surgery, uh, thromboprophylaxis uh, around surgery as well. And without good, solid orthopedics outcome data, these policies are going to be driven by other subspecialties, by other people doing this research. So if we don't have it on our side and the evidence on our side, unfortunately, we're going to be targeted with policies that aren't generated by us. We have a choice. We can be leaders. We can come up with our own uh, strategies, our own policies, or we can be followers and just um, be subject to the policies that are given to us. And with that upbeat note, I am going to leave you with Dr. Lee, uh, who's going to talk to us about the use of uh, outcomes data and talking about complications. Um, before we start, I just want to define complications. So complications was well defined by one of our former partners, Dr. Sohel Mirza. He defined it as any event in the course of a patient's treatment that has the potential for causing harm to the patient. And that's a pretty wide, inclusive definition if you think about it. And we tend to think about complications as the horrible things that keep us up at night and keep us from sleeping. But really, it goes beyond that. And a lot of things are complications which we don't necessarily uh, give the same attention to. So, you know, I'm sure when all of you saw the title for this Grand Rounds, you might have had the same reaction that I had. Oh, outcomes in orthopedics, a little bit more dry, you know, there's not going to be any sexy x-rays here, no cool videos from the OR. And I had the, that, that was my reaction when I first had this assignment. <laughs> um, but as I got more into it, as I really started researching the topic and preparing these slides, and you, you, I realized the profound importance, just as Dr. Chapman and Dr. Matson uh, alluded to, the profound importance of this topic and how it's going to affect every single one of us in this room and how we go forward and how we practice. And I didn't realize how much I was thinking about it and how much it was actually consuming me until this past weekend when I was watching The Lion King with my daughter. And uh, for those of you familiar with this Disney classic, there's a scene where James Earl Jones is telling his son Simba all about the circle of life. And as my five-year-old daughter was listening to and learning about the circle of life, I was reminded of the circle of research. And I've got to re include this slide in my upcoming <laughs> Grand Rounds talk. So maybe that shows you how much of a nerd I am. I don't know. But it, that, that's how important this topic is, that it was actually impinging on my personal life. Um, the research cycle, I want to introduce this topic because I think it's important for us to just at least have a familiarity with. This is nothing new uh, from Tugwell and others in 1984, and I got the slide from Darren. But it starts off down here. You have your burden of disease and the causal pathway, and eventually we develop an intervention. And an intervention can be anything. It can be a treatment. It can be a, a medication. It can be a surgery, any kind of intervention. And when we look at intervention, we test the three E's of intervention. The first one is efficacy. How well does this intervention work in a study, in a controlled study where you're controlling your variables, controlling your follow-up, and controlling the, the, the rendering of the intervention? Secondly is effectiveness. And effectiveness is how well does this intervention work in the real world, you know, where patient compliance may not always be accounted for. Um, you may not control for all these variables in the real world that you can control for in a controlled study. The third E is efficiency. And not to make this more confusing, it's essentially synonymous with cost effectiveness, not to be confused with just plain old regular effectiveness. But efficiency is looking at cost. If a treatment has good efficacy and good effectiveness, well, how much does it cost to render this treatment? If it costs a zillion bucks a day, is it really worth the bang for its buck? And then we get into the integration of treatment, the monitoring of the intervention, reassessment, and back to, the, uh, back to uh, starting the cycle all up over again. So I, just, I wanted to introduce the slide because I will refer to it when we talk about the impact of complications. So how do complications affect clinical outcome? Now, the knee-jerk reaction might be, well, complications are bad, so therefore they negatively affect clinical outcome. Done. Next slide, next speaker. But what I would say to you is it's not quite that simple. Certainly, the severe complication will have a profound impact on quality of life. But what I would submit to you today is that the vast majority of complications don't necessarily have a negative clinical outcome. And we'll go through some examples. So I'm a spine surgeon, so just as an example, we'll take dural tear. Now, I don't know how many of you residents and how many of you fellows have ever seen a dural tear during spine surgery, but if you have seen a dural tear during spine surgery, you'll know that there's a lot of things that can happen after that dural tear. So we see a dural tear during spine surgery. Typically, we'll stitch it up, we'll patch it up, and we'll glue it. And from that point on, a lot of possibilities can exist for that patient. 
One possibility is on day one, a patient will get up, start walking around, no sequelae, no headaches, and it'll be like it never even happened. Or the patient will get up on day one, develop a postural headache. The surgeon may elect, well, you know, let's put you flat on your back for a day or so. And that patient's discharged, that patient's rehab is delayed by a day or so, but the patient gets up and does fine. Or that patient's headaches don't, uh, th th that patient's headaches, uh, don't resolve, and the patient has a large fluid collection contained by the wound, they've got symptomatic headaches, and that surgeon may opt to take that patient back to the OR for, repeat, uh, for, for an IND and uh, readdressing the CSF leak. Or you might have a situation where that wound is not containing that fluid collection, now CSF is leaking from the skin, and this increases the risk of surgical site infection and horrible things like meningitis. Or there might have been a nerve injury associated with the original dural tear, and patient may have neurological deficit, which may be long-lasting. So you can see just from a simple dural tear, there's a wide spectrum of what can happen to a patient afterwards. And just as a, there's a wide spectrum of what can happen to a patient afterwards, there's likely to be a wide spectrum of what the health-related quality of life score will be for that patient, depending on which possibility that, or which, which road the pa patient goes down. What I would submit to you today is that the correlation of the severity of complication doesn't, is the correlation of the severity complication to the quality of life score is poorly defined, and I think this is an area of uh, potential great investigation. I want to give you one example here. This is a patient of mine who has an obvious kyphoscoliosis, as you can see from these AP and lateral x-rays. It's a 54-year-old male, status post lumbar fusion and laminectomies at an outside hospital, and these were complicated by a MRSA infection. He is status post intrathecal morphine pump placement, which at the very least speaks to his complex pain response, and uh, we can anticipate some challenges in his uh, postoperative analgesic management. He has osteoporosis, and this has, comp uh, this has challenges for fixation and uh, deformity correction. He's diabetic, which is another comorbidity for complication, and quite frankly, he's desperate. So after extensive, extensive preoperative counseling regarding the risks, benefits, potential complications, and goals of surgery, we decided to go ahead with surgery and we did a deformity correction and a long fusion. Now in his hospital course, he did have a CSF leak interoperatively and this was repaired primarily. Five days later, he had fluid draining from his incision and it was a seroma-like fluid, great. Draining wound because of his prior infection, thought we'd be aggressive about it, take him back to the OR, wash him out, get him as clean as we can be. About a week later, he starts having headaches and he has more fluid draining from his incision and this time it's not seroma-like fluid, it's clear fluid, it's CSF. So we take him back to the OR, wash it all out again, and look for the leaking of CSF. And we, I, wasn't, I was never really sure if it came from the dural tear site or if it came from where the intrathecal catheter went in. So it didn't really matter. I, I augmented the repair on both of them. And then we closed them up. And then two days later, his cultures came back positive for infection. So we had to start him on IV antibiotics and a PICC line and, and antibiotics for at least six weeks. And during this time, I had a conversation with a patient. And he actually told me, these are the worst three weeks of my life. And I wish I never had this clearly a poor clinical outcome at this point in time, and discouraging words for a young surgeon. I get this email from the same patient one year later, and I put an excerpt here on this slide. Gratitude simply is inadequate to describe my feelings. I no longer have pain which plagued me for 20 years. I do not take pain pills and rarely take muscle relaxants. Again, thank you. Life is good. And the point of the story isn't to tell you what a great surgeon I am or how well my patients do. The point of the story is that this is a patient who had multiple complications, severe complications that required a lot of treatment afterwards. And even though it was tough in the short term, in the long term, its clinical outcome is good. I mean, I, I don't have a health related quality of life score, but this pretty much says it all for me. So life is good. Now, if you go back to this research cycle, well, we ask the question, well, where do complications have their impact? You know, if, if we're saying that complications don't necessarily have an impact on, on clinical outcome, what is, what's the importance of complications? Well, complications here don't necessarily affect efficacy or effectiveness. They can, and don't mistake them, they, they certainly can affect these two E's. But the big E is here, efficiency. Where with a complication, there's always going to be some sort of monitoring or some sort of, some sort of treatment afterwards which is going to incur cost, and that will ultimately affect the efficiency. If we go back to this dural tear example, with every single one of these possibilities, there's going to be additional cost. You know, I didn't put a dollar sign here, but if you think about it, it takes 20, 30, 40 minutes to repair a dural tear, and that's OR time, and that incurs cost. So whatever happens after complication will incur some form of cost, whether it's as simple as monitoring, keeping in a hospital for another day, repeat OR, rehab, or long-term IV antibiotics, there's gonna be some additional cost associated with the complication. If we look at this patient here, sure, we got a great clinical outcome, life is good, but look at the additional cost. Repeated washouts, extended hospital stay, extended rehab stay, long-term antibiotics, pain management, et cetera. 
So we find that as important as clinical outcomes are in how we practice, important as clinical uh, outcomes are, it really will be balanced against cost, and that's just reality. And uh, this is already in effect, we know whether we like it or not. This is from the CMS website. CMS has declared certain conditions to be hospital-acquired conditions. And these are essentially complications such as surgical site infection or falls. And in the event of a hospital-acquired condition, there will be a quality-adjusted payment. So basically, CMS is already uh, starting to not pay for some of these complications. Quality metrics are all around us. They're becoming increasingly prevalent, and they're, they're largely safety and cost-driven. I guess a, uh, a pessimist would say that they're largely cost-driven, and an optimist would say that they're largely safety-driven. And the truth is probably somewhere in between. I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to talk about some of our, our just give a highlight to some of our research being done by one, our residents here in this department, uh, Grant Lose and others looking at falls, and this will be in uh, JBJS published pretty soon, and also Elizabeth Daly looking at risk factors for readmission orthopedic surgical patients, and this is in review with JBJS. So in conclusion, this Grand Rounds is really about clinical outcomes, the importance of clinical outcomes, and how they'll affect us in our, in our future practices. But the reality is this has to be balanced against cost. Um, and this in itself, the balancing of cost versus clinical outcomes, is in itself a metric, which Darren's going to speak more at length about and how it'll impact us further in the future. Thanks. <laughs>
So though there's a three and a half month improvement in survival, what's the quality of life over those three and a half months? This study, just looking at an RCT, doesn't get to that. If we use health-related quality of life utility scores, we can measure that. To put it in a different perspective, let's look at a sarcoma patient who survived for 25 years after treatment and look at what their quality adjusted survival is. So two years of treatment, they rate their health at 0.5, followed by survival of 20 years at 0.8. They then develop cardiomyopathy related to their chemotherapy, survive with that for three years at a score of 0.3, and then they die. So their overall survival is 25 years. Their quality adjusted survival is much less, just under 18 years. Moving on to other applications of these utility scores, getting a little bit more controversial now. Decision analysis integrates the probability of various clinical outcomes with the patient preferences for those outcomes. Cost effectiveness analysis those cost on top of that to give us another layer of information. And this is a theoretical example comparing a surgical treatment with a medical treatment and you can see the different, prob or different outcomes for each treatment option as well as the probabilities for those outcomes, the cost and the quality of life associated with each. And by basically taking a weighted mean of each one of these arms, we can directly compare the surgical treatment to the medical treatment, both as far as the quality of life it provides, as well as the incremental cost that is spent to obtain those outcomes. When we look at incremental cost effectiveness, the results can be depicted on this graph called the cost effectiveness plane. And there's two main areas to note. One is the more common situation where you, you spend more money, but you get better health and then we need to decide how much money we're going to spend to get better health. The other, where, other aspect where we need to make decisions is there's less cost, but there's also poorer health associated with it, so we almost have to look at how much money do we want to spend. The two areas where there are essentially no-brainer type decisions is this, where there's less cost and better health, and where there's more cost and less health. Obviously, those types of treatments we don't really have to make a lot of decisions about. Moving that principle into, into some real-world examples. This is a recent study of patients with lymphoma who are over 65 treated with curative intent. And the question being studied is, should they have primary or secondary prophylaxis with factor stimulation in order to prevent febrile neutropenia, which can be a big um, player as far as whether or not these patients are cured. So RCTs are done and shows that there's evidence of a decreased risk of febrile neutropenia with primary prophylaxis, meaning they're given the stimulation medications up front. And as a result of those studies, both American as well as European societies published recommendations that primary prophylaxis should be used. But there were no cost studies and no health-related quality of life studies associated with it until this particular study, which studied it and looked and found that primary prophylaxis is associated with a cost of $700,000 per quality. To put that in perspective, the generally accepted threshold for adopting a new treatment is $50,000 per quality, and in some instances it's $100,000 per quality, so that's a big, big difference. So if you remember that cost effectiveness plane we looked at before, this is where the results of this study lie, in this quadrant where you're spending more money and getting better health. And you look down at the scale for the x-axis and the improvement in health is very modest, to say the least or maybe to say the most, and the amount of money being spent may not be a lot of money, but relative to a very small improvement in health, you end up with $700,000 per quality. Another way of looking at their results is this acceptability curve, which basically looks at, as we change how much we're willing to pay for this treatment, what is the likelihood that the treatment becomes cost-effective? So even when you get out here towards a million dollars you're willing to pay, the chances of it being cost-effective are still less than 50%. And that's just another perspective on these results. Other ways that we can use this um, type of methodology is to look at our own biases and then to get really contentious public health policy. First, our own biases. Not to pick on the medical oncologists, but this is kind of a neat study of 1,400 medical oncologists who are presented with hypothetical scenarios of a new chemotherapy drug and asked how much would they be willing to spend in two scenarios. One is to prolong life, the other is to not prolong life, but to improve quality of life. And there's a two-fold increase you can see in how much they would spend in order to prolong life, even if it didn't improve quality of life, compared to just improving quality of life. Now we get contentious. So in many healthcare systems, evidence-based methods are used to allocate healthcare resources. 
And this follows the premise that there's limited resources and every treatment cannot be provided or is not affordable to every potential patient. And perhaps the best example of this is in the UK, where NICE, the National Institute of uh, Health and Clinical Excellence, provides recommendations to the National Health Service for which treatments should be adopted and provided in large part based upon a systematic review of the evidence and an economic evaluation, meaning cost effectiveness. So they're gonna use cost effectiveness to decide what treatments are gonna be provided to the population. And this is a recent publication specifically in oncology, but it, but it gives an idea of, of what this institute does. So here's a bunch of different chemotherapy drugs, what the cost effectiveness ratios were found to be and whether or not those drugs are recommended and hence provided through the public system in the UK. And you can see that they're using a threshold somewhere around 50,000 pounds because it's in the UK in order to decide what they're going to provide to the population and what they're not. So in conclusion, outcome measures can provide a greater depth of data compared to the traditional measures that get used. Different types of measures exist and choosing the type of measure is really essential in order to meet the goals of our studies. And in order to choose the best measure, we have to consider the psychometric properties as well as the goals of the study. And on a broader basis, these measures can be applied to clinical outcomes, to clinical research, as well as to public health policy. And since we have a little bit of time, we're going to just do a little case study of, in a real world scenario, how can these measures provide us with different information. And I'm going to borrow some cases from my, from my fellowship in Toronto, so another Canadian disclosure. So the question is, how do you reconstruct a pelvis after taking out half a pelvis for managing a sarcoma? And the patient we'll look at is a 26-year-old female who has a Ewing sarcoma involving her right hemipelvis. Some cross-sectional imaging. Now, regardless of how you're going to reconstruct it, she's going to get neoadjuvant treatment. She's going to have the area of the sarcoma excised. And the question comes down to reconstruction. And the choices really are don't reconstruct it, do what's becoming a bit more popular, a flail limb or a section arthroplasty, or reconstruct it either with allograft or a prosthesis. This is a different patient. It's hard to find exact patients that are exactly the same when, when you're looking at these hemipelvic resections. But he has a sarcoma involving his hemipelvis, has it excised, but does have a little bit of bone remaining and has his saddle prosthesis placed. And initially does very well, but at five years, following his surgery, develops a mechanical failure. You can see the prosthesis is broken here. So he has that revised. A year later, it becomes infected has multiple attempts to get the infection eradicated, and eventually ends up with a resection. The research that's been done on endoprosthetic replacements following hemipelvectomy shows there's a very high risk of complications. These are not mutually exclusive. They frequently go together, and it's generally thought that the overall risk of a complication with an endoprosthetic replacement following a hemipelvectomy is somewhere in the neighborhood of two-thirds, pretty high. This is a patient that we are talking about. So the 26-year-old, she had her hemipelvis excised, did not have a reconstruction. This is her x-ray at nine months. Obviously, the limb is shortened a fair bit, and she requires a shoe lift. But the preliminary research that's been done on this type of a reconstruction, or lack thereof, says that six out of eight patients walk without an aid. That's not immediately, a couple of years after surgery. And their outcomes, as they were measured in that study, are pretty reasonable. And now, hopefully, there is plenty of time for discussion. So, outstanding presentations. Thank you very much on behalf of the audience. Uh, now that we're entering this era of uh, not just digital medicine in terms of numbers, but also acronym SALAD, my question to you is who's going to pay for this? Uh, a couple of years ago, when we did a comprehensive spine outcomes data gathering, the per annum cost per patient was calculated at $224. This is spent out of a, um, a donated fund that we had from a gracious uh, uh, external donor. But how are we going to do it in healthcare? Is this an unfunded mandate uh, from the government, Dr. Daly, or is this something that we're supposed to somehow scrounge up, or is maybe industry yet again, uh, again held culpable for this? So who's going to pay for this? Well, so at the patient care level, I think your patients are going to start asking us more frequently, uh, how much does this cost? I think that as far as the outcomes data driven um, studies go, I, currently I, I think that we are in a place where we 
have some availability of funds, but not necessarily as much as we would like. Um, the law that I referred to earlier in my talk uh, has a $850 million uh, purse, basically, that's going to be rewarded to places who do well, and that money will be available based on your outcomes measures that they have chosen. Um, and that money comes from a 1% reduction in all costs or all payments. So beginning with that law, all Medicare is going to be cut by 1% per year to award the places that are doing well. And that's that $850 million number that they come up with, which is amazing to think that that's 1% of their budget. Great, thank you. Let me ask a secretary question to Dr. Matson. Dr. Matson, you've been visionary in having the probably simplest, most effective outcomes uh, score that I know of in orthopedics, the simple shoulder test, and that's uh, to your credit. How much does that cost per head, and what's your advice in terms of how we can keep things simple and affordable, and who should pay for this? So we, we use the simple shoulder test as a vital sign. In other words, it's as no more or less costly than taking blood pressure. It, uh, the patient fills it out, and it needs to be entered. It's a simple, uh, as Liz said, a simple score that has only 12 elements in it. And I think that uh, my vision of the future is that we would just collect this kind of data, whether it's a simple spine test or the simple shoulder test or the simple foot and ankle test, but collect that every time a patient is seen and make sure, as Codman says, that we uh, have the data at, say, a year after treatment. And then ask ourselves, as he admonished us, to look at the patients that were not improved by treatment and uh, ask ourselves, if they didn't get better, why didn't they not get better? So comment and question. First, this was great. This was an outstanding summary of the environment we're facing. And to start answering some of these questions that have come up, I'd recommend to all the residents that you go open your browser and bookmark AHRQ and sign yourself up for the newsletter that comes out of this Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research because it'll give you ideas and it'll give you summaries of what's being done elsewhere. And to answer Dr. Chapman's question, how do you pay for it? It's really, really expensive. And if you take the road that Dr. Matson has taken, which is to build your measures into your patient care, you can obviate 90% of the cost of this. Because if you make this research, it's going to cost you $1,000 per patient. If you make it part of your health care, and then you only have to mine the data from your patient care records, then it's far less expensive and far more useful. So I guess the question to the group is, how do we integrate not just patient care and outcomes, which we've always done, but this quality of life measures? Because that is a far more difficult metric and it has to make a lot more assumptions. How do you, how do you integrate that into your patient health care record? I'm not sure that's been worked out terribly well by anybody to this point. I think that these measures are, in many healthcare populations, very well established for research purposes. Um, I'm aware of some areas in oncology where they have been shown to have actual predictive and prognostic implications for outcome. But beyond that, I don't think there's been that transition just yet between research applications and clinical applications as far as collecting these sorts of measures on a regular interval and using them for clinical purposes. Um, the one potential sticky point we can get into um, using these for clinical purposes is, is that these measures do cover all aspects of, of health, so pain and function, which we're used to determining and assessing clinically, but also things like anxiety, depression, psychological aspects, which we aren't. And if we're getting information about this under the proviso of clinical care, then that leaves us, I think, with the responsibility to do something about it when patients screen or score in a way that would potentially indicate a major problem. So not a simple answer to your question, but it's, it's an evolution, I think, and hasn't been integrated completely. I think there's a risk of making it too complicated, though. I think that uh, if we dedicate ourselves to the idea that we would need to measure something about how well the patient is doing as a routine measure, as Bruce says, and make that part of the medical record, then we're getting close to the answer. The, the, there is a real tendency, as you see with, for example, the musculoskeletal outcome assessment or some of these long questionnaires to have a huge cost uh, associated with collecting these data. But again, I would like to repeat the idea of include something like a simple test just 
some simple functional questions and make that part of the vital signs that you collect on your patients and make sure it's collected on every patient. Ted Hansen, when he spoke a number of years ago, said that everything he's learned in life is from his failures, and it's hard to imagine somebody as successful as Ted learning from his failures. But I think that that uh, algorithm is applicable to each of us, that we need to know what our own failures are and need to find out what they are, and we will only find that out if we have some sort of routine assessment of whether or not the patient is getting better or not. I don't have a great answer for your question, Bruce, but I mean, th just what would or, or repeat your stress of this is really important that we have to do it. Because in our experience with spine scope, which is a branch of scope which we're all familiar with, we're trying to collect some of these outcomes and measures. We're trying to expand our data harvesting from the general community. And there's been a little bit of a, um, a backlash. How is this going to affect my practice? If I spend, if the patient spends another 10 minutes filling out a form, well, that means I see a less number of patients per day, which is going to affect my bottom line. And yeah, that's, that's true. But the bottom line is if we don't do this, if we don't be proactive in taking these measures and looking at what we're doing. Someone else is going to do it for us with a different interest in mind, maybe not the patient's best interest in mind, maybe with a priority on cost. So we have to be involved. We have to take an active uh, role in this process. And, I, and I, that doesn't answer your question, but I just want to stress the importance that we do get involved in this. So. Mike, can you comment on the use of technology Microphone. to collect the computer-assisted technology and measuring outcomes and how you can integrate that into your patient outcomes? And I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, so if traditionally we've had patients fill out their outcomes on paper and then someone would have to take that paper and then transcribe it into a computer, into a database, and that, that incurs costs of paying that person to do that, that the resource involved in, doing, in, in, in that data entry. Now, ideally, it'd be nice if we can have a, a website or even a tablet that the patient can use during, during the, uh, while they're in the waiting area. There are challenges there with HIPAA compliance. Um, there are ways around those challenges, but I think ultimately technology will greatly assist us in getting those data. <clears throat> if we can get to a point where a patient, if we, if we can get to an acceptable point where patients can easily enter those data um, with minimal um, burden on their time and, and on the clinic time, that's ultimately ideal. Um, but there are all sorts of challenges. I know Darren's been actually trying to get a data registry set up for, for a tumor. And well, you can talk about the challenges you've encountered. But technology will help us. But there are, there are definitely logistical, bureaucratic barriers that we have to get through. Yeah. No, I, I think that's kind of where things are moving, is to have a lot of these measures obtained electronically. There's a lot of obvious advantages to it. There's no paper copies to get lost, no paper copies that have to be manually entered. Um, anybody that's done any quality of life or health outcomes research is always going to be frustrated by those questionnaires where it says, you know, circle which of the following five best represents how you feel, and somebody circles two because they think they're in between, and now you got to throw that out. Um, you don't have that issue with, with computer entry, but it, also introduces areas of, well, if it's computer entered, then it's got to be maintained, it's got to be monitored, and that incurs additional costs as well. So. Yeah, great points. I uh, just want to add a quick editorial before I ask another question. Um, when we did a recent study on the utilization of a common outcome score called SF36, if applied in routine clinical follow-up, we found that it's pretty meaningless. Uh, why? Because patients are influenced in their return to visit, uh, clinic visits when it's just obtained on a routine basis by whatever burdens them right now, which may have nothing to do with the actual disease that you're trying to study or your intervention. So um, this is a point that we can't just utilize these scores as much as we'd like to for a specific target unless we really kind of have a crossover into the research domain and have specific follow-up periods, such as one year afterwards and two year afterwards, and have very target-specific questionnaires, such as, for instance, the simple shoulder test. So just an editorial comment, we, we can't just basically have patients at their follow-ups that are not uh, a sequence uh, fill out these forms and expect some great insights, especially the SF36 has actually very little to do with general orthopedic concerns and is, uh, I think, crass overused. I would definitely echo that sentiment. I think there's an editorial by Rick Bransford and Julie Agle recently talking about this very um, subject, whereas just routine harvesting of data without a specific target, without a specific goal in mind, with the idea that, well, well if you come up with a research, research question later on, we can always go back and mine those data. Well, if you do, you find that those data aren't necessarily filled out completely and properly, and, they're, they're not, and, and your research question is basically gone. To do it just routinely for the sake of routine, I think there has to be more of a goal, more of a more of a uh, process to, to drive that effort um, to ask, answer a specific question. But just routine collecting of something like the SF36, which can take a long time to fill out, may not be the best bang for your buck. So I completely agree with that. <laughs>
And one of the aspects to that as well, sorry to interrupt, is to not just have that one outcome measure, but to consider that you want to have something that's more specific either to the joint or the disease process being studied or that you're interested in clinically so that you can orient those data a little bit. So if you have SF36 data from, or whatever generic measure from a time point, but also at the same time point, a disease or joint specific measure, you can start to tease out a little bit of what factors might be driving whatever score they're reporting on their generic measures. Now let me bring up the question of complications. Uh, Mike, you showed a very impressive case. Uh, uh, all of us abhor complications. The case that you showed is an almost virtual guarantee for a complication to occur, at least one, if not multiple complications. I applaud you for your honesty in showing the complications. Um, if we look at this statistically, for instance, with the Washington State Spine Scope, which uh, Mike Lee deserves a lot of credit of having uh, fostered and having uh, uh, brought in a new era of transparency and accountability for spine surgery in the state. If you look at this from a Washington State Spine Scope, your own tool, you will appear as a complication. Obviously, it's an expected complication. Should we somehow weigh types of complications in terms of how likely they are to appear or not? Is there some, some justice in terms of uh, the severity of cases that you do? Absolutely, absolutely. There needs to be some sort of risk adjustment process to looking at complications. You know, we think about these quality metrics and they're straight bars. 30-day, well, 30-day readmission is being scrutinized, but 30-day readmission for someone who's a transplant patient with a big T10 and pelvis is going to be different from a 30-day readmission from a healthy 25-year-old with no other medical comorbidity. So, so naturally, the patient's makeup, the patient comorbidity, the surgery being done, all those have to be taken into account. And there needs to be some sort of risk adjustment modification to, to a lot of these metrics we're looking at so people know that you know, the reason why the University of Washington has higher complication rates is because the patients are sicker and different procedures are being done. It's something that's already intuitive, but if you just look at these metrics straight up, which is just a straight cutoff, you don't necessarily get that picture. And if now if financial reimbursement is being directly linked to those metrics, well, there needs to be some sort of a qualification of, of what we're looking at. Um, I think it's something that we all intuitively know, but it, the onus is on us to produce this in the literature so we have literature to back up our, our, our statements. So. This is, if I might add something is just a huge, huge problem with all of these paper performance models that exist in different, different places. Is, as an example, um, in Ontario right now, I've heard from a friend of mine that's working there that does a lot of joint replacement. They're looking at moving the joint replacements out of the academic centers to the community centers because when the government looks at it, they say, wow, the community centers, they do it cheaper, they have better outcomes. Of course, they don't look at the fact of exactly what you're talking about, that the academic centers are taking on those more difficult cases. And it's the more difficult nature of the case, such as that spine case that's leading to more cost and more complications. And what Liz was saying earlier, I think is very, very important and very true, is that when the health policy makers make their decisions in isolation without our input and without our data and our evidence, we have to live by their rules and sometimes their rules don't reflect reality. So giving a patient a satisfaction questionnaire to somehow reflect the quality of care they've received, I don't think that's a particularly validated or reliable way of assessing how well their health care has been provided. Yet that's, those are the rules we now have to live by or will have to live by. So we need to take a very active role in trying to shape the way that this is all going to be measured. Otherwise, we might find ourselves in a, in a place we don't want to be. And if I could self-indulge for a second, you know, we've actually done a lot of research here at the, in, in the University of Washington Medical Center looking at complications, particularly for spine surgery, because that's what I do. Um, but you know, defining these risk factors, we've had a lot of success, and Amy Sizek has done a lot of work in this. And we're in the process of making a model, a predictive model, where we can actually look at a patient, look at their comorbidities, look at the surgery that's going, going to be done, and actually project a percentage with reasonable confidence intervals of likelihood for complication after that procedure. And that kind of a tool will help us greatly in sort of in this risk adjustment process. And I think that's kind of a lot where research is headed right now, just not only for spine, but for, but for all of medicine, really. So. Well, thank you for an outstanding session.